These videos are educational in nature and are designed to help people over 21 who smoke cigarettes switch to a less harmful alternative. <clears throat> All right. Well, what's up, everybody? It's Grim Grain back here. And today, listen, we're going to be talking about flavor bands. And I know that this is something that us vapors are really sick of hearing about. But stick with me because this video is actually about a large brand new study. Flavor bands are like the go-to restriction for nicotine vaping. I mean, other than taxes, other than taxes, it's flavor ban. The logic being that flavors must be what are attracting underage people to vaping. So theoretically, banning those flavors would stop underage use and still allow adults to have, you know, tobacco vape flavor. I'll put some links in the description of this video to the other times I talked about flavor bans. But like I said, today's video is unique because we're going to be talking about a big, new, large scale study done by health researchers, Abigail Friedman, you know, Yale School of Public Health, Alex C. Liber, Georgetown University Cancer Prevention and Control Program, Alyssa Crippen, Yale School of Public Health, and The Economist, Michael Pesco, University of Missouri Department of Economics. So essentially what they did in this study was use nationwide flavor policy data. So what areas do and don't have a flavor ban, and then matched it to national tobacco retail sales data. They do also use the term ENDS here a lot, which I don't use. It's FDA terminology that means uh, nic electronic nicotine delivery system. I would honestly rather call it an e-cig than ENDS. So the first and most awful thing that they found was that for every one 0.7 mil pod that was not sold due to a flavor ban, 15 combustible cigarettes were purchased instead. Yeah, uh, they said that any public health benefits of reducing ENDS use through flavor bans may be offset by public health costs from increased cigarette sales. So the Mike Bloomberg funded campaign for tobacco free kids who argue in favor of local and nationwide flavor bans through their actions are actually causing more kids to smoke cigarettes. But that's not even all they've found so far in this working paper. And I have to thank Reason Magazine for getting access to the full paper and posting like a good portion of the body of it. They also found, which I'm gonna end up saying uh, like 18 times in a row, but they also found that the general trend is like this seesaw situation. States that impose restrictions on flavored vaping and e-cigarettes end up in the trend where, yeah, e-cigarettes Cigarette sales drop, but cigarette sales go up. They also found that the longer that the flavor ban goes on, you know, over a year or more, the more pronounced this seesaw effect is, or honestly, what we call product substitution, substituting a really harmful thing with a much, much, much less harmful thing is called harm reduction. It's good for public health. Flavor bans are achieving literally the opposite of this. They also found that a significant portion of the increased cigarette sales due to a flavor ban on vaping and e-cigarettes comes from tobacco flavored e-cigarettes not menthol. So it's not just about menthol or about flavors. They say this is a broader substitution effect. They also found, okay, I think that's actually the last one, but they also found flavor restrictions seem to impact sales across all cigarette age profiles, even the cigarettes popular among underage users. They call it a concerning pattern, suggesting that these policies might not be as effective as people think in helping protect youth health. So here's the thing. I was a little bit hesitant to share this right now, only because this is currently a working paper, meaning that it has not been peer reviewed as of this date. But when that changes, I'll obviously post the full paper in the description. Both Abigail Friedman and Michael Pesco already have published and peer reviewed papers on almost this exact same topic, just not this exact methodology of this paper, I believe. I will never deny that underage people are getting their hands on vaping. It would be foolish to think that they aren't. And it's something that should be discouraged. Was it ever an epidemic of underage use? Look, no youth should be using nicotine. That's why we have 21 and over laws nationwide for literally all nicotine products. I can kind of even forgive like the knee jerk reaction of an uninformed politician thinking flavors are what is driving underage youth because that's what the CDC is telling them despite the CDC data not actually showing that. But now we can clearly see this pattern emerging that these flavor ban policies 
not only are failing, but actively causing more harm. It's long overdue to course correct. And the good news is it's not too late. You know, vape flavor bans are a spectacular idea if you want or need more cigarette sales in your state. Listen, I I'm a man of science and I know that correlation does not equal causation, but it is really interesting to see which states are closest to defaulting on their MSA tobacco bonds and which states have enacted vaping and e-cigarette flavor bans. Now, if you want to know what the MSA is, I'll put a link in the description to a video that explains it flawlessly. Drop me a like if you found this informative. Consider hitting that subscribe button because there is a lot of tobacco, nicotine, and vape related misinformation out there and ain't nobody bothering to correct it. This has been a Grim Green video. Let's stay cigarette smoke free literally every single day. <coughs> it's like 10 30 and then I'm uh, just gonna smoke so... On flavored vaping flavored vaping flavored vaping <laughs>